Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. This week we've got a very exciting new paper on the Spinosaur Irritator and a special interview with the lead author of the new paper on truly giant pliosaurs from the UK. First up in the paleontology news is a new paper on the enigmatic Spinosaur Irritator Challenge Rye, which has made some pretty interesting discoveries about the feeding mode of this animal. The fossils known for Irritator actually represent the most complete skull of any Spinosaur so far found, and so using microcomputer tomography scan data of the skull, the authors have refined our understanding of the cranial anatomy of this Spinosaur. Some of the main findings include the discovery that Irritator would probably position its snout at an incline of around 45 degrees when it had to look closely at the things around it, since this allowed the snout to stop blocking the view from the eyes, enabling for binocular vision and therefore better depth perception. Another finding was that the jaws were suited to biting very rapidly but relatively quite weakly, presumably an adaptation to catching fast moving prey such as fish. But the most intriguing discovery, and something that's now inspired a great deal of Peliwart, is that the lower jaw joints had a morphology that meant when the mouth was opened, the lower jaws would open out to the sides at the base, opening up the pharynx even wider. This sort of jaw function is also seen in modern pelicans, but through a different mechanism. So as if spinosaurs can get even more bizarre, it now turns out that they had giant pelican jaws too. Sort of. It should also be noted that the publication of this paper has resulted in a lot of discussion about the return of the Irritator holotype back to Brazil, as it's currently housed in a museum in Germany. So that's another incredible development in the story of Spinosaur research. These animals really do never cease to amaze. Next up, we have a special report on the publication of some truly giant pliosaur vertebrae from the late Jurassic Kimridge clay formation of the UK. We were lucky enough to get an interview with the lead author of this paper, Professor Dave Martill, who gave us a bit of information about the background of this discovery and its implication on the ecology of late Jurassic seas. The full interview will be in a future episode of Boneheads whenever we get back to those, and the interview itself was done while we were on a university field trip to Germany, which we've also recorded for Boneheads, so please excuse the slightly unusual setting for this interview. Anyway, here's me and the Boneheads crew with Professor Martill. So welcome everyone to this 7 Days of Science special interview with one of the authors of the new paper on this giant pliosaur uh, from the UK, uh, Dave Martell, and we're just here to ask you a few questions about this spect uh, spectacular new find. Um, so I think it'd be best if we kind of go to the, the beginning of the story of giant pliosaurs in general, and of course, so you're one of the advisors on Walking with Dinosaurs, uh, famously <laughs> creating the, the giant like Pleurodon, um, so how did that come about? Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks for inviting me along for a chat. That's good. That's good right. to see you guys. Um, yes, yeah, so going back quite a while now. It's yeah. three decades, isn't it, for walking with dinosaurs. Yeah. When Tim Haynes was making the program, he was uh, sort of, if you like, running wild, trying to find what would be the best way to approach this, what would be the best animals to have, and where could we film it, and what sort of themes could we use. And he sent a researcher out to speak to all sorts of people and to discuss this, and I suggested that maybe uh, they could use the Oxford Clay Sea as a theme. And uh, at first they thought this was a bit strange because they were going to essentially do a program containing lots of dinosaurs, uh, of which very few are marine. <laughs> and so he uh, asked about what sort of star animals he could have in the program. And I suggested that there was some pretty impressive marine reptiles, an incredibly large fish, but that also the Oxford clay had yielded dinosaurs as well. And uh, when I told him about these animals, he seemed pretty impressed, uh, especially when I said that there were some giant pliosaurs uh, and a giant fish called Leedzichthys. Mm. And I gave him lots and lots of star animals to choose from, but of course budgets were limited for making the pilot programme and a few things had to go, uh, but a few things were essential. So he needed a dinosaur. And I gave him Eustreptospondylus, yeah. which at the time nobody had ever heard of. <laughs> and so that animal now is well known, just yeah. simply because he got he, he was a, a, a theropod dinosaur that had drifted out into the Oxford Clay Sea. And... Um, I took uh, Tim and the researcher to the Natural History Museum in London to show them some particularly large remains of pliosaurs that were very, very fragmentary. And they were collected by Alfred Leeds uh, back in the latter part of the 19th century. 
and part of this Leeds collection, and some other bits and pieces that had come in in subsequent years, but not complete skeletons. Now, Lyre Pluridon had, had been uh, complete or near complete skeletons of Lyre had been found. There was one in the Natural History Museum in London, and there was also uh, a nice example in Tübingen University collection. Mm. And these animals are around about uh, six metres long or something like that. Um, just depending on whether you know whether the whole animal was collected and whether maybe some of them are composites and things like yeah. that. But because there are these other fragments that indicate even larger animals, um, we had a go at trying to calculate the size of these animals with these fragments. And we, we weren't being, trying to be particularly accurate. Uh, there wasn't that much data around to be able to do proper scaling. And so we came up with a figure that quite a few people accepted as around about 18 to 20 metres uh, as, as, as a large pliosaur. Yes. And not necessarily Lyre Pluridon because we're using bits and pieces that could have belonged to other genera. And there was also material from the Kimmeridge clay formations, particularly a very, very large lower jaw in Oxford, which is getting on mm. for sort of three metres long, huge thing, you drive yeah. a car into it. So what we did was we, we came up with this figure that I think, I think it was about, about 18 metres or something like that, 20 metres. Uh, and then we, we realised that the data set was incredibly small. There, there really weren't that very many specimens of, of these animals known. And so we thought, well, you know, when you look at sauropods, from the very first discoveries of things like Cetiosaurus, which are fairly small ones, they've, they've just progressively got bigger and bigger and bigger. More yeah. and more discoveries are made. Same is true of pterosaurs. And so we thought, well, maybe it's true of pliosaurs. So we added five metres. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We just added five metres. Yeah. And of course we got all sorts of criticism, but we never really got an opportunity to explain why we did that. We just thought we were preempting what might be discovered within yeah. the next hundred <laughs> years. And it just sort of it got it got put in there. And then it, the, the the mass that was given to it, um, I think Tim then went to speak to somebody who works on biomechanics and things and said, well, yeah. if we've got a marine reptile of, of 25 metres, what would it weigh? And he, I think he came up with 100 tonnes because of blue whale. <laughs> <and stuff>. wow. <laughs> so so the, the, there wasn't a huge amount of science that went into that. Right. But our new discovery is, is a really serendipitous find. I mean, I hope that the reports that have been out on the paper haven't given the impression that we've been out and discovered a great new skeleton lying in the ground. There's no field work, no discovery involved other than pulling open museum drawers. Mm. Um, and that's one of the ways to make great discoveries, actually, is to go and find yourself in a museum and start pulling open yeah. the drawers and see what's in there. <laughs> uh, lots of stuff gets missed. Um, Meg Jacobs, who's one of the authors on the paper, um, wanted to go to Abingdon uh, to look at an ichthyosaur that they have, a really nice ichthyosaur that has, has never been studied. And so I took her up there, and while she was taking photographs of this ichthyosaur that's on display, um, I noticed that there were some drawers underneath it, and they were there essentially for children who were visiting the museum to pull open and see, yeah. see what it was, though they're kind of going through the museum collection. And uh, in one of the drawers, I saw a, a huge vertebrae, and uh, it was sort of this sort of, this sort of diameter. Wow. But I know, I know pliosaur vertebrae. I, 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 collected enough, excavated enough pliosaurs to recognise one of their neck vertebrae when I see them. Yeah. And I thought, that, that, looks like a, that looks like a pliosaur vertebrae. So I asked if I could have, take it out of the drawer and um, was given permission to do so. I photographed it and measured it and everything. Mm. And, and, his, and the curator said to me, he said, well, we've got three more of these. <laughs> so we, but they were yeah. in another location. So right, we yeah. went back. Uh, and saw these other three, and they have got all of the hallmarks of cervical vertebrae of, 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 of a pliosaur, yeah. uh, but they're actually from different positions in the neck. Mm. Uh, so some of them are very, very close uh, to the pectoral vertebrae. One of them might even be a pectoral vertebrae. It's, all, it's either the, the first of the pectorals or the very last of the, of the cervicals. And then the rest are some position somewhere along the length of the neck. Now this gives us an opportunity to actually scale up. Now since uh, you know, the days of walking with dinosaurs in those early days. Um, many more pliosaurs have turned up, especially in South America, with complete yeah. cervical series. And that gave us an opportunity to, to scale up. I mean, some of our scaling in the past was based on some of the Liassic pliosaurs, which are actually, they've got very, very long necks and short heads and mm. things. And you, 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 you can't really apply 
the, the uh, protocols that you use for scaling to those uh, Jurassic forms. But using some of these Cretaceous forms and late Jurassic forms, especially some stuff that's come from Mexico, places like that, we were able to, to develop a, a range of figures, if you like, of which yeah. the top is something like 14, 14.2 metres which is an astonishing large yeah, right. animal if yeah. you think about it and it's uh, way bigger than a killer whale for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's, that's, that's the story. We, we, yeah. we weren't excavating, we were <laughs> pulling drawers open <laughs> in a museum. Yeah, it's an amazing way to find uh, you know, such an exceptional fossil. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and it, is a, it is a way to make discoveries. If, you, yeah. if you're unable to get to, to, to distant places, um, go to your local museum <laughs> and see what's hiding in the drawers. Yeah. Who knows what somebody <laughs> might have brought in. Well, it doesn't always need to be like a full skeleton to make these grand discoveries. Sometimes it is just these old oh, bones here and there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so that kind of leads me to another question I had, which was what kind of uh, inferences can you make about kind of the ecology of uh, the, the Cambridge clay oceans with the, all these massive uh, pliosaurs around? That must have been quite a, a dangerous place to live in a way. It wouldn't have been a good place to be a diver swimming yeah. trying to... <laughs> to, to, to um, uh, Sort of explore the sea floor because uh, you would you would be a, a prey item as soon as you at the water in there. I think um, if you have a look at the diversity of the of the vertebrates that are in that sea, from mm. you know the fishes to the to the pterosaurs and the pliosaurs and the ichthyosaurs and things, there's a lot of them. And yeah. we're only just realising now with the Kimmeridge clay that we've kind of, this is a formation that we've overlooked a little bit. We've put a lot of attention to the Oxford clay, mm. a lot of attention to the Toarsian, uh, Whitby mudstone formation and the and the Lias of Lyme Regis, the, the, the oldest Jurassic strata in, in the UK. Um, but the Kimmeridge clay got a little bit overlooked and yeah. I'm not sure why that should be. Um, now we've got the etches collection uh, available to look at and, and Steve's still going out there collecting. We are we are getting a lot more material now. The sea was really productive, mm. really, really productive. Most of the Kimmeridge clay is organic rich and that tells you that there was a lot of productivity in the surface waters, absolutely full of microscopic algae called coccolithophoroids and they were the base of the food chain and that was being fed on by the zooplankton and the zooplankton keeping the fishes going and the fishes were keeping the reptiles going and then in the re within the marine reptiles I mean everybody was killing everybody else depending <laughs> on how big yeah. they were so little ichthyosaurs were probably being eaten by some of the metrorhynchid crocodiles like Dacosaurus and the Pliosaurus mm. but then as they grew bigger then they would be preying on other things so there's a really complex food web there if you look at the dentitions of these things some of them have got very specialized dentitions there's a a very elongate snouted uh, pliosaur, uh, which, uh, well, pliosaurus, mm. pretty elongate snout, and likely could feed on, on fishes and squids with this mandibular symphysis, very long with lots and lots of teeth and bears. Um, similarly, uh, some of the ichthyosaurs. The crocodile, Dacosaurus, has got a big moor on it with yeah. huge dagger like teeth. And some of the bigger pliosaurs have also got these huge dagger like teeth, one a big rosette of. Uh, teeth at the end of their snout. They probably were twist feeders. So some of the animals were probably able to feed on prey bigger than themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, you've uh, got some very nice diagrams dividing them up into different ratios, and that's how you've worked out the size. So could you use that on other specimens, you know, maybe you've got in mind, or maybe other bones in the skeleton? Well, for this particular animal, we don't have any more material other than the four vertebrae that were found. And sadly, uh, I believe that when the specimens were discovered, which is really quite a long time ago, um, the, there were likely to have been many more bones. And we, but only a few got collected and somebody apparently went back to the site to go and collect some more and by then the site had kind of disappeared. So sadly for the animal that we've just described, well, there's nothing much more that we can do with it. Um, but, you know, pliosaurs are just fantastic animals. And really, I mean, anybody could do this. People should just go to museum collections and pull open drawers and look to see what they've got. <laughs> uh, and take a few photographs with a ruler in place and then see if you can compare them with that, what's in the published literature. Because, yeah. I mean, it's just... I mean, I don't, I don't, just playing size is, you know, <laughs> willy-waving, isn't it? Mine's bigger than yours sort of thing. But, you know, when you've got animals that are this sort of size, 
then you know you're thinking wow this is one hell of an ecosystem we've got here this is yeah. something where the predators are bigger than today's marine predators yeah we you know what was that sea like what was it what was it like to be an ichthyosaur even though you're four or five meters long knowing that there's a a pliosaur that's twice that size or even even three times that size yeah. uh, okay. prowling the same sea so um, if I come across any more bits and pieces I'll certainly be considering uh, writing them up Build that database. Yeah. yeah and uh, yeah but uh, it, it I think one of the things that it does demonstrate is one don't ignore your museum collection. This is Abingdon is a small town. It just happens to be on the outcrop of the Kimmeridge clay, and therefore, at some stage in its history, some Kimmeridge clay bones have come into the collection. Yeah. yeah. So don't ignore your local museum. Um, and the other thing is, do field work. We are still after. When did paleontology begin as a serious science in the UK? Probably a couple of hundred years ago now. Yeah, I mean, there are there are papers on marine reptiles written on material that was being discovered by Mary Anning in the very early 1800s. Here we are, you know, 2023. So we've had a couple of hundred years or more of collecting fossils, and we are still discovering new animals, bigger animals, weirder animals, uh, and it's happening all over the world. It's still happening in the UK, so we should be getting out there looking for fossils. Hmm. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. Um, yeah. My last question was just: so, do you think this was the this was the animal that the bit the Abingdon ichthyosaur? <laughs> <laughs> You've done a piece on the Abingdon ichthyosaur, uh -huh. haven't yeah. you? Um, uh, well, it, it could have done. It wouldn't. Yeah. Have, it, in fact, you know, what, what's the length of the Abingdon ichthyosaur? Is four and a half, five meters? Around there, yeah. yeah Skull's about 1.2 metres. Yeah, so. yeah, which is always about a quarter. And the ichthyosaur yeah. is a rough, rough guide. The skull is a quarter of the length of the animal, mm. um, if we consider the tail a bit bent down, don't we? Yeah. So, uh, yes, absolutely, it could have done. It could have bitten it in half, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I mean, one of the things is that these big pliosaurs, uh, they probably went in for twist feeding. Go mm. and get a bite, and then using your flippers, just spin yourself around, and you'll tear off a bite-sized piece. It couldn't get an ichthyosaur down its gullet. No. No way. No way. But Not it could get it could get a flipper yeah. and uh, it could get a bit of muscle off the side for sure. For mm. sure. Yeah. Which bits are you missing? Actually the hind well one of the hind limbs and a bit of the yeah, tail. Yeah. So. And, and then if 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 it floated the pliosaur could then go in and take a few more yeah. bites back and actually fill its belly. Yeah. <laughs> but what if it sank? Mm. It would have found it would have would have been a, an enormous amount of food arriving on the seafloor for all the animals that could go down that deep and certainly would have been covered in fishes and all sorts of other things. Yeah. So there's a few other things that could make those bites as well. But aren't some of the bite marks on the ichthyosaur healed? They are, yeah, they're, they're mostly healed. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it definitely survived. Yeah, yeah. so... We, how, for how long? Uh, probably not well, too long. But there's a crocodile in the Posidonia <laughs> Schiefer which has got a completely oh, yeah. bent lower jaw, <laughs> yeah. completely healed up. And, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> he's definitely lived for a few months more. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. But um, yes, thank you so much for, for talking to us about this amazing sure. new paper. And um, yeah, go out and look at your local museums, see what they have. Maybe you can make a, a discovery like this. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. You're okay. Thanks. Thank you again to Dave for doing that interview with us and to Jordan and Roy for filming and also to Meg Jacobs, the other author on this paper, who's done some amazing paleo art of this animal. And again, do be sure to catch our future episodes of Boneheads to see this full interview and also see our documentation of our field trip to Germany. We went to the Messel Pit, we got to visit Sonhofen, go to a quarry exposing the Posidonia Shale and visit some truly astonishing museums. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this episode, and happy International Dinosaur Day to everyone. Apparently it's the third Wednesday of every May, so enjoy this international holiday, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>